Good evening, everybody. Welcome to a place to call home, Affordable Housing Town Hall. We'll just let people get into the webinar tonight. And we promise we will be giving you some Raptor scores during the meeting. Very important. When we set this up, the Raptors were down three nothing. And so uh, just like the Raptors, we have to rise up and, and build affordable housing. And we're gonna make this almost as exciting as a basketball game. Welcome to everybody joining tonight. Give everybody a few minutes to get on. Just give people a moment to get on tonight's meeting. And we are competing with a big basketball game. So you're here. Thank you to our great panelists who are here and to everybody who is coming on tonight. Okay. Welcome everybody to a place to call home, Affordable Town Hall. And uh, I will do the land acknowledgement, of course, at the beginning of the meeting. We always do. We acknowledge that the land we're meeting on tonight is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. So thanks very much for joining us tonight. And uh, this was a very interesting week here in the East End. We did a lot of things around affordable housing. We opened so with the deputy mayor and uh, housing secretariat. We opened the 36 units officially of Wood Green Seniors Housing at Gerard and Leslie. And then the, what well, I call the OMB, it's the OLT, but it approved a settlement for the first uh, units for Black North, which is a project for Habitat for Humanity for the Black community. And that was just approved this week as well, which I think is very exciting. And then today, Deputy Mayor was with Councillor Bradford across the way in East York, um, cutting the ribbon and getting things moving on the modular housing here in East York. So that's a pretty good week. Tonight, we're gonna to be looking at all of the many things that we do around affordable housing and um, from small, to big, and you're gonna hear about some amazing work that's going on for affordable housing. What this is, is going to be about affordable housing and there's a very clear definition and you're gonna hear what that is. And what it isn't going to be tonight, but we've done other times and we can still do, is really about how we're gonna protect housing from Airbnb, 18,000 units that have been given over, rental given over to Airbnb, rent evictions where we have a subcommittee, shelters and supportive housing, all so critically important. But tonight our focus is just on affordable housing in the city of Toronto, how we're building it, what we're doing. And we have a fantastic panel and I wanna thank everybody for coming tonight to present. Uh, tonight we have our Deputy Mayor Anna Bailao, who is the Chair of the Planning and Housing Committee for the City. She's a City's Housing Advocate. I think she has uh, personally gone to CMHC and she has just amazing at getting funding for housing and also for TCHC for all of the repairs. So thank you for all your work, Deputy Mayor. We have Abigail Bond, the Executive Director of the Housing Secretariat, and Valesa Faria, the Director of Housing Policy and Strategy from the Housing Secretariat. And many years ago, Deputy Mayor chaired the Affordable Housing 
committee. It was a small committee. It wasn't really a standing committee of the city. And under her great leadership, we've moved to having a planning and housing committee and a housing secretariat, a full-blown division for housing in the city. And we're very, very proud of that. And with us tonight is all So Salima Raji, and she's the VP of Development at CreateTO in charge of the Housing Now program for the city, which you're going to hear about tonight. MPP Peter Tavins, Toronto Danforth, who uh, ran the Bain Co-op for years and was on the first wave of the big national housing program back in the 70s and 80s. And then Joy Connolly, well-known housing advocate, East Ender from the Circle Land Trust, somebody who helped Deputy Mayor and myself save 600 homes from being sold, hundreds of bedrooms from being lost. And so long time advocate. So thank you so much for joining all of us tonight. I'm just going to do one or two polls so we know who's here. And the first one is, uh, where do you live? Do you live in Ward 14, um, north of the Danforth? Do you live south of the Danforth? Or do you live outside of Ward 14? So if you're outside of our great ward, we welcome you. And of course, it's always great to be with everybody here in Ward 14. So thank you for that. We'll let that go for another minute and then we'll let you know who's there. Lots of guests tonight. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to end that very shortly. And we have 40% from Ward 14 south of the Danforth, 21% north of the Danforth, and 40% from uh, outside of Ward 14. So thank you very much, everybody. And then here's one other one. So the panel really knows who you are and what you've done. So do you have direct experience of affordable co-op or supportive housing, either as a provider, a tenant, an advocate, or other involvement? So you can add more than one because many of you who are here tonight have lots of hats that you wear. And thank you for that. I think everyone here is really interested in building affordable housing, making sure that we get that done in the city of Toronto. Thank you. Uh, lots of advocates. Yay for advocates. Quite a few tenants, number of providers, and lots of other. We don't even have a category where we can tell exactly who you others are, but we know you're other. Um, very good. Keep going for another second. And I'm going to close that poll off in a second. And then we'll get to our program. Okay, uh, providers, tenants, advocates, and others pretty well across the board equally there. So it's a good cross-section of folks here that know about housing. So as you can see from the agenda, we're gonna hear a little bit about what the city's doing. And I'm gonna first call on our deputy mayor to really give this overview of affordable housing with a bit of a political perspective. Thank you very much. Take it away, Anna. Thank you, uh, Councillor Fletcher, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be here with the residents of the Danforth and some other ones from outside Danforth. Um, and, and thank you for organizing this important conversation, Councillor. Um, you are such a champion of affordable housing at the City of Toronto. Um, uh, and, and it is crucial because we approve the big plans, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our housing plan 2020-2030. But then we need the support, the cooperation, the enthusiasm, the commitment from the local councillors to also bring these to the wards and to make sure that we are implementing this in the local level. And I can't think of a bigger champion than Councillor Fletcher. And, and I'm sure we're going to talk about a few examples throughout the evening on how she's doing this locally and ensuring that the big plan is also being translated into lots of benefits and creating mixed communities, vibrant communities, and in creating opportunities for everybody to live in our city. So thank you, Councillor, for, for your passion, for your leadership, and for your work on affordable housing. Uh, uh, I, I would like to say that we've come a long way in the last 10 years. 
Uh, we had our first uh, housing plan approved in 2009. It was the 2010, 2020 housing plan. It was the first time that we had a charter for housing and we had a housing plan. And at the time, some of you might think, might, might remember, we had a goal of approving about a thousand units a year. And we weren't even meeting that. Um, I became a counselor uh, in 2010. And I'm sure the counselor uh, Fletcher remembers and Joy remembers because we had some fights that term. This was a term that, you know, we were selling social housing and, and a few of us had to get together with great advocates and great people like Joy Connolly to make sure that we're gonna stop the sale of social housing, that we were gonna uh, pivot to say, that municipal governments need to be in the business of housing. It is our business as well. And I think that's where we started pivoting. Um, and so we now have a plan that we approved. It's a 2020, 2020 to 30 uh, housing plan. And you'll hear from the other speakers about a lot of things uh, that we have in this plan in more detail, but I want to give you a little bit of, of an overview. This is a plan that is going to help about 340,000 residents in the city of Toronto is going to create about 40,000 units of affordable housing. And out of those 40,000 units, 18,000 is supportive housing. But I always like to start uh, to talk about this with four things in mind. The first, the first thing is that for housing, when people talk about housing, and we often get this when we make an announcement, the first question we get asked is, is this going to solve the housing crisis? There's not one solution that is going to solve the housing crisis. We need many tools in our toolbox. And the reason that that is, is because housing is a continuum. When we talk about housing, it's all the way from supportive housing to social housing, affordable housing, workforce housing, to market housing, because they all influence each other. And so we need different tools in the toolbox. And that's what our plan is. It addresses these different tools because at different points of the spectrum, you did you did, did different solutions as well. The other thing is there's no one order of government that can do it alone. We need three orders of government committed to this, to this issue and the participation of the private and the nonprofit sector. We need everybody all hands on deck. And uh, the other thing that I usually say is that we can't build our way out of this and we can't fund our way out of this. Some people just say, government just put money, 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 money. And some people just say, oh, supply is all the answer. Just build more and we'll get all the answers. No, uh, supply will never bring the solution for what we need, for example, with supportive housing. The market will not bring you those solutions. You need governments to invest in that. You need the provincial government to invest in the supportive housing. You need the federal government to invest in the capital. You need us to you know, come up with what we're doing with the land and, and the DCs and so on. We need all three orders of government. Market will never solve for that. We need to ensure that the funds that we have are invested in the part of this housing continuum that we get the most deep affordable housing and then have other solutions to get things that are the, what we call the workforce housing, the affordable housing. So we have other tools to deal with that. So our plan has many, many programs. So we have everything from the supportive housing that we are creating. And today, as Councillor Fletcher mentioned, we, we just uh, 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 brought more units to uh, the East End with our modular housing. This has been a project that we started during the pandemic and we're doing, we're doing well. We're using our land, new construction methods, and we're bringing uh, supportive housing into this. And this is, a, it needs to be done because we need to change our shelter system from being a de facto housing as it's being used today to actually creating truly supportive housing and have the shelter being what it's supposed to be, a shelter and creating support, supportive housing for people. You also need to maintain the social housing stock that we have. That is why it was so important for us to stop the sale of those homes. And I'm sure Joy is going to talk about what we've done and ensure that we're never going to be in that situation again. We actually pass the ownership of these homes for land trusts. So we know that we're never going to have any other politician wanting to try to sell those homes because I think Councilor Fletcher and I are traumatized. We don't want to have this fight anymore. And so we're not going to have it anymore. And so we needed to make sure that that, that happened, but we also needed to make sure that we had TCHC funded appropriately 
and with a capital plan that was funded appropriately. So we lobbied the federal government and now we have a 10 year capital plan funded that is actually doing the repairs because we don't only have to build more, but we have to maintain the stock that we have. That is very important as well. Then we also, like I said, we need to build more as well. We have to maintain it and then we have to build. And that's why we created programs like the Open Door Program where we give incentives. Uh, and this last one, we had almost a thousand units approved mainly to nonprofits to create nonprofit housing. We also did something very important in the city of Toronto. We stopped selling land for highest and best use. We started using the land value to create affordable housing in the city of Toronto. We have 21 sites right now. And I know that Salima probably will talk a lot more about that program. But this was a big initiative. It was a political decision. It was a strategic decision that said, we're going to stop selling this land for highest and best use. We're going to use that land value. and We're going to create mixed income communities. And we're going to use that value to create affordable housing. We also uh, created a program, the um, multi-unit, uh, 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 the MURA Residential Acquisition Fund, because we know that in some communities we're losing these homes and we have to provide the support for some of the nonprofits to be able to get it. It's a hot housing market. We need to make sure that the nonprofits are able to buy some of these units. And so the city of Toronto has stepped up to the plate. We continue to advocate to other governments to join us. We think this is a great program. But we have stepped up to the plate, and this year we're going to have twenty million dollars available for nonprofits uh, to buy some of these homes. It's also important to defend uh, uh, and and support tenants. So Councillor Fletcher has taken a leadership role on creating a tenant committee to see how we can stop renovations. We know that a lot of this is related to the province, but we're not leaving it just to others. We're saying, what can we do? How can we support tenants? We introduce vacant home tax. We introduce the inclusionary zoning. We are looking into the EHON program, which is actually dealing with zoning, creating more housing options inside our neighborhoods. So all this are solutions that is gonna take us from what I said, from a supported housing all the way to market housing, various tools in the continuum. But for this, we need the champions and we've got the champions to approve this plan. And now we need the champions to make sure that we bring these into the communities. So that's why it is so important to have, like we have here in our community, in your community, Don Somerville, that we have the Danforth study where your counselor fought really hard to make sure that affordable housing was a central piece, a piece of, that, of, that, of that study. So all this, all these big policies that we have in that plan then get translated. And that is so important that we have the politicians that then have the leadership to make sure that we're translating that at the local level. Thank you so much, Deputy Mayor, for your leadership, for the fantastic overview, and uh, you never stop. You're always there trying to get all kinds of housing built, and it's just a real pleasure to work with you on that. I'm just going to call on next Abby Bond, the Executive Director of our Housing Secretariat, and as I mentioned earlier, we'd had an affordable housing office, but now we have a whole division, and it's very exciting. It's brand new, and I know Deputy Mayor, you played a big role in making that happen as well, because you can't do what we need to do with just a small office. It takes a huge team. So thanks so much tonight for joining us, Abby. Please take it away. Uh, thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, on behalf of the Housing Secretariat, we're thrilled to be here and have this conversation. Housing is our passion. Uh, so I'd like to share some slides with you about uh, some of the, the work that we're doing. So just bear with me a moment and I will um, share my slides. So hopefully you can see that now. Um, so as I said, I'm Abby Bond, the Executive Director of the Housing Secretariat. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, Toronto and what, it, what its housing context is. So for some people, it's surprising when you learn that actually almost half of the households who live in our city are renters. Um, only 53% are actually owners. So really a lot of this, a lot of our residents rely on rental housing and the health of rental housing to be successful in our city. 
we know that about one in four renter households, and this was back in 2016, uh, pay more than 50% of their income on housing. And really, once you're paying more than 30% of your income on housing, it really compromises what else you're spending your money on. So if you're spending too much on housing, you have not enough left for food, transportation, recreation, clothes, your children, health, all those kinds of things. The other thing I want to highlight is just how the city of Toronto has really changed in relation to housing. So the map that I'm showing you here on the right hand side, you can just about see three little pockets in green. And, and what these green pockets are in our city right now is a place where a household who's earning about $50,000 a year can afford to rent a one bedroom apartment. So you can see that not really much of the city at all is affordable to those kinds of households. And that's why we do the work that we do. So we can create many more options and really improve the health of our rental housing market. So as the deputy mayor uh, has already indicated, we have this robust 10-year uh, plan, which is really comprehensive. It's rooted in housing as a human right. And it really has a multiplicity of different actions and policies, some of which you'll hear about this evening. And again, as the deputy mayor mentioned, it's really about that housing continuum. So not just one type of housing, but all different types of housing from social housing, affordable rental and co-op housing, all the way through to affordable home ownership. So really our two main um, areas of focus in the housing Secretariat are delivering affordable housing programs, which include our open door incentive program. So this is where the city of Toronto provides a financial incentive incentive to those organizations who want to develop affordable housing. So we offer them a financial incentive to encourage them to use their land and their own funding as well to deliver new affordable rental housing. The other thing that Salima is going to talk about, so I won't discuss much of this, is the Housing Now initiative where the city is developing on its own land. So that's really for affordable housing. And I'll talk about who are the different types of people who would live in each of these forms of housing. The other is social housing or rent geared to income. So this is really, which is the modular housing, supportive housing that we were talking about before, uh, funded through the Federal Rapid Housing Initiative and the City of Toronto's Emergency Housing Fund. So as we've already discussed, we need an all of government approach. What does this mean from a financial perspective? So to go along with our 10 year plan, um, we have a 10 year financial plan. And as you can see, we have costed out, we think our 10 year plan to deliver will cost around $27.7 billion for the full 10 years. Right now, the city of Toronto is the largest investor. We have committed over $7.1 billion as part of our 10-year capital plan um, and still have more to do, but we're in increasing that investment every year. And we see a federal government investment of about 2.1 billion so far and a provincial government investment about 0.6 billion. So we still have a way to go with all of our government partners to fully fund our 10-year plan. So a little bit about what's different between social housing or rent geared to income housing and affordable housing programs. So for social housing programs or way the rent you pay is geared to your income, it's really based on the rent being no more than 30% of your household income. Where in terms of affordable housing, it's really much more based on the average market rent in an area. For social housing, you will join a wait list and you may wait for many years for a, for a home, a new home. So right now there are almost 80,000 people waiting for social housing in the city of Toronto. In terms of affordable housing, right now we run random draws to select res new residents for th that housing. So uh, just a brief description, the different types of income. So for uh, rent geared to income housing or social housing, there are two examples here. One is a single parent uh, with two ch children who is on Ontario work. So their household income may be around 7,200 a year, and they can really afford to pay only about $226 per month on rent. Another example might be an elderly couple over 65, uh, with a household income of around 27,000 per year, and they can afford to pay just under $700 a month. So really social housing or rent geared to income housing is for people who are on very low incomes. 
Affordable housing, on the other hand, you see a number of examples here from like an early child educator who may be earning around 35,000, a retired pensioner at 38,000, a construction laborer um, at around 39,000, and a licensed practitioner practitioner nurse at around 51,000. So these are all the kinds of people, people, uh, just regular people living and working in the city of Toronto who will benefit from affordable housing. And then the last slide I will um, talk to you about is our definition of affordable housing, affordable rental housing. So last year we changed our definition to be linked to income. So here you can see we've split this by bedroom type. So you can see when we say affordable housing for like a studio, we're saying that where the rents are no more than $812 a month, uh, where somebody who's earning no more than $32,000 a, a year can afford to live. So this definition will help us make sure that the housing that we built is afforded by the people who live and work in our city. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, pass it back to you, Councillor Fletcher. Thank you very much, uh, Abby. That was really a great primer on everything. Uh, and it'll be great to have those slides and we'll be posting this after. We did just get one chat. Could you just talk a little bit about Indigenous housing and what the relationship is with the Indigenous community, please? Thank you. Yes. Um, great question. It's really important to us as part of our truth and reconciliation action, actions that we're committed to, that we have a really strong relationship with our Indigenous housing providers. Uh, we work with them every month, we meet with them every month, and a really guiding principle of that is that it's for Indigenous, by Indigenous. So this is a real partnership that's led by our Indigenous providers. So the city working in partnership, looking for opportunities for funding, for land and for projects, but it's very much guided. It's not something where we're out in front leading that, that this is something where our partners are center stage and really guiding our work. So lots more to do on this issue. It's definitely an area, a future area of work for us, um, but something that's very important to us. Thanks very much, uh, Abby, for that. And I will just say that for all of you on here not watching the game, that the Raptors are just behind a tiny little bit by 22 to 18. So I'll keep you updated as we go ahead. Um, I'd just now like to call on Valesa Faria, who is the Director of Housing Policy and Strategic uh, and Strategy for the Housing Secretariat, and just to talk a little bit about co-ops because that's such an important type of housing that got dropped in 1995 and we're really trying to bring that back. Thank you, Valesa. Thank you, Councillor, and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today I'll talk about housing co-ops in Toronto. Um, next slide, please. Oh. So we'll go through a few things. Firstly, what is co-op housing? How are co-ops governed? We'll talk a bit about co-ops from coast to coast to coast all across Canada. We'll talk about co-op housing in Toronto. We'll talk about the importance of maintaining our existing co-op housing stock. We'll look at a few current and past projects that were, that were and are being supported by the city of Toronto. And we'll talk a bit about new funding to increase the supply of co-op housing across the city. Next slide, please. So what is cooperative housing? Cooperative housing or co-ops are democratic organizations where members decide on annual budgets, rules, and policies. So there's no outside land works. A typical Canadian co-op owns houses and or apartments and rents them to members for an indefinite period of time and on an at-cost basis. So there's no additional profits. It's typically just at cost, the cost of operating the buildings. Co-ops frequently have both market units as well as subsidized units, and they provide a wide range of homes for a wide range of people and incomes, helping to create diverse and mixed income communities across the city. Next slide, please. So how are co-ops governed? The members of co-ops are the ones who are responsible for running the co-ops. Co-op members elect a board of directors annually to handle detailed management issues, including overseeing the day-to-day -day operations. While each co-op is owned by its membership, individual co-op members do not typically own equity in their housing. And as members move out, the vacated units are made available to others who are on the co-op's waiting list. 
Next slide, please. So there are co-ops all across Canada. In most of the co-ops that are existing are rental co-ops and they were developed in the 1970s and 80s under government social housing programs. And they were targeted to people with low and moderate incomes. So currently there are about 2,200 nonprofit co-ops, uh, co-op uh, buildings across Canada that are homes to about 90,000 households or over 250,000 people. And on the right of the screen, um, this is an indication of, um, of the number of co-ops and units across Canada. Next slide, please. So co-op housing in Toronto. Historically, co-ops across the country, as I mentioned, were funded through a variety of uh, federal, provincial, and municipal programs. In Toronto, the vast majority of co-ops are federally funded through long-term fixed mortgage agreements with CMHC, and they, they are also provided funding to bridge the, the difference between the subsidized members' housing charges and those of the market rental members. And around the mid-1990s to early 2000s, the federal, the federal and provincial governments changed their approach to affordable housing and gradually started transferring housing programs and responsibilities to municipalities. Next slide, please. So maintaining our co-op housing stock. Our co-op housing stock provides a central, um, is an essential tool in our toolkit to provide nonprofit housing in Toronto and across Canada. As co-ops reach the expiry of their operating agreements with the federal and provincial governments, many are unfortunately finding themselves with aging buildings that need major repairs and upgrades. And without the continued federal and provincial support, these homes are at risk of being lost. The City of Toronto supports and works with organizations like the Co-op Housing Federation of Toronto and the Co-op Housing Federation of Canada to help co-ops with the transition and we also work with these organizations and continuously advocate for funding from other orders of government to prevent the loss of these much needed affordable homes. Now we'll just go through a number of projects, past and current projects that are supported by the city of Toronto. So the first is a really great project right here in your ward in Ward 14. Um, and this is the Riverdale Co-op at 685 Queen Queen Street East. So in July 2020, City Council approved the allocation of almost $5 million in Section 37 funds. So this was through Councillor Fletcher's leadership. Um, additional city capital and financial incentives were also provided to support the redevelopment of this aging building. The existing co-op has nine units um, that are pretty much at, at their end, end of useful life and need of replacement. So the redevelopment for this building will ensure that the nine units are replaced so the nine units are within the existing heritage structure plus 17 new units will be added and these will be a range um, of bedroom types uh, including some larger um, units for families by the end of the redevelopment there will be a total of 16 sorry 26 brand new units and riverdale co-op has partnered with streetcar developments to deliver this project um, and we'll, the co-op pair will be leveraging streetcar's development expertise, plus will realize economies of scale due to streetcar's um, active developments adjacent to the site. Construction will be starting very soon, and we're expecting occupancy to begin in 2023, which is quite exciting. Next slide, please. So another great project turn in your ward is uh, the Don Somerville project, which is at uh, 1555 to 1575 Queen Street. So through the revitalization of two um, former six-story Toronto community buildings, a total of 766 residential units will be developed, including 120 replacement RGI units, 100 net new affordable units, 180 market rental units, and 363 condominium units. Um, what's really exciting here is by the end of this redevelopment, almost 29% of the total residential units created will be affordable housing. The project will also include uh, some retail space and really great amenity and outdoor spaces for residents. And as part of this redevelopment, the city will acquire 32 units. Um, and these units will be leased to a nonprofit co-op housing provider for 99 years. And construction on this project is estimated to begin later this year. 
So this is a past, this is an example of a, a past co-op housing project, not in your ward. This one is in 60 at 60 Richmond Street East. So this is an 11 story building, which um, is the site of a former emergency shelter. Um, 65, sorry, 85 one to four bedroom units were created. And this was completed in 2010. Um, it was the first co-op housing built in Toronto since the 1990s. And it was developed as a partnership with Toronto Community Housing, the Co-op Housing Federation of Toronto, and the Unite Here Local 75 Hospitality Workers Union. The project includes a restaurant and a training kitchen on the ground floor, and a community garden on the sixth floor. It also includes a mix of subsidized units that are priced slightly below uh, market, market rates. And the tenants in this building include former some former residents of Regent Park, as well as members of the local 75 union. The, the slide shows uh, other co-op um, projects across the city. So 10 York, which is Naismith Co-op, um, through this project, seven two bedroom units were secured within a 65 story condominium building. Um, and they were transferred to the co-op as part of a section 37 agreement, and the units were, were occupied in 2017. At two or three College Street, Cawthra Co-op um, also secured four accessible units, and this was also through a, a 30, section 37 arrangement with the city, and occupancy began last year on these units. Um, there is also the ongoing um, TCHC led Alexandra Park uh, redevelopment. So this is at Bathurst and Queen. As part of the Alex Park redevelopment, um, Alexandra Park Co-op will be uh, will be uh, will be developing sorry six, six net new ownership units as well as some affordable co-op rental units on site. So this is ongoing, and these new, new units will be coming online over the next two to three years. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned before, co-op housing provides an essential form of affordable housing across Toronto, in Toronto and across Canada. And it's really important that we continue to increase the supply of these new homes. Um, we have developed some units over the last number of years, but we need to do a lot more. So what's exciting is in the recent 2022 federal budget, there was a commitment of 500 million of direct funding and 1 billion in loans to launch a new co-op housing development program, which will build 6,000 6, units nationally, creating a new generation of co-op housing for low and moderate income households. Uh, while the city of Toronto does not yet have details of the program, we're eagerly awaiting um, and are poised and ready to work with the co-op sector to increase the supply of new homes across the city. Next slide, please. Okay, I think that that brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much for that deep dive into co-ops, Felessa. And because there will be some money, we should understand what a great form of housing that is. And that 60 Richmond was uh, something that the late Pam McConnell fought for in the Regent Park redevelopment. And we wore that one proudly. And we're really fighting hard and including in TCHC, to have self-managed co-ops in smaller in smaller communities, so um, that is uh, still on the books. And I know that in TCHC revitalizations, that's something that we're also looking at adding in. So thanks for mentioning that. I'm going to jump now to you, Salima, for the housing now, and uh, just say that the deputy mayor and I are both on the Create TO board and have the great pleasure, joy, and responsibility of overseeing this incredible program that um, she mentioned when she started in taking city's land and use, instead of selling it, which had been happening for quite a few years, actually putting it to work for the biggest issue of our day, which is affordable housing. So please, Salima, thank you very much for being here tonight and look forward to hearing about this. 
Thank you so much. My name is Salima Raji, as been mentioned. I have the pleasure of, of helping to lead the, the Housing Now initiative, which really is a partnership uh, between our colleagues at the city and us at, at Create TO. Um, I'll share my slides now. I'll try to keep it tight so we can get to the conversation. Um, and lots has been mentioned, so you'll see references to, to pieces of other uh, components of presentation that have come. So the Housing Now initiative um, is actually three phases that have been brought forward over 2019, 2020, and 21, uh, 2021 of now 21 sites across the city, all city-owned lands, all transit-oriented, and our goal is to create mixed income, complete communities. And so when we think about housing, we're thinking about how do people access that housing and ensuring it's transit oriented, but also ensuring that there's other elements that go along with that housing so that we have sustainable communities in the long run. And so this map just shows you across the city where they are. And there's a little star on the one that borders, uh, that's in Ward 19, but borders Ward 14, that we'll take a little dive into in a moment. Um, you saw reference to this slide in Abby's presentation, but Housing Now really focuses on the affordable renting ho rental housing component, as well as market rental housing and market ownership. And that's because the city is trying uh, to use its assets like land and take advantage of market tools like market housing to bring together opportunities to create in a really efficient um, financial way, uh, affordable housing. And so here's a quick look at uh, the project at 1631 Queen Street, which is just east of Coxwell on the south side. Um, this project is about 280 units, which will have a minimum of 92 units of affordable housing. Um, the rest of the units will be market rental housing. Um, the market rental housing will also have rent control. So they'll, uh, even though there'll be market units, they will, it will be ensured that the, the rent on those grow at a pace that is relative to how people's income grows. Um, that's controlled through provincial guideline amounts um, and sort of set amounts that we put into the program. The project will also contain family-sized units. And so when we bring the project forward and we partner with developers to create these buildings, we ensure that they're building enough two bedrooms and enough three bedrooms, and that those units aren't just uh, two and three beds, but they actually have minimum size requirements and minimum elements around how they look and how they feel so they can function for families living in those units. Um, we all also put um, rules around accessibility to ensure that there's enough uh, both market and affordable rental units that have um, features of accessibility as guided by Ontario Building Code. Um, we're thinking about climate, and so our Toronto green standards plays a big role. We don't just, you know, sort of go to the minimum bar, but we really push ourselves to, um, you know, a higher level. In this case, it's a new set of standards that's coming out actually next month, May of, of 2022. There'll be a new set of green standards, and we're, we're taking a step forward and, and saying we're going to go to level two of that new set of standards. Um, there's an existing use on the site of a, a daycare and that has about 30 spots available and we're actually going to double the size of that daycare so adding a gain capacity for the community outside of the building that we're working on. Um, and in this project particularly, um, the council has directed us in, in partnership with uh, Valessa and Abby and their team at the Housing Secretariat to ensure that we bring on an Indigenous development partner to create this building. And so um, when Creteo uh, takes forward this opportunity, we'll ensure that it's an Indigenous developer that, that takes it on and, and produces the, the rental units. And then lastly, what's important to us um, as we look at city lands and we look at city assets and we're creating construction job opportunities that we're thinking about those equity deserving communities and ensuring that jobs are going to those communities that need them and that we're creating capacity and skill through bringing forward these housing programs as well. So the big kind of looming question is how does it get paid for? Um, and it's, it's a little bit of a complicated math, but I've tried to simplify it by saying it takes, and I think Deputy Mayor Bailao really started with this tone of, it takes partnership by all. It cannot be done by one sector alone. Um, and so in the case of housing now, the city is bringing forward incentives, um, it's bringing forward tax waivers, it's bringing forward uh, permit waivers, 
It's bringing forward its land. Um, that is in, in, in the portfolio, when we last looked at the portfolio sort of mid 2021 and prices have moved a lot from 2021. But if we were thinking about this in 2021, we would say the city was putting in over a billion dollars into just these 21 sites. Actually at that point it was 17 sites into those 17 sites. We're asking the private sector to come forward and participating and getting the opportunity to build these units and um, you know have those market units. We're asking for a billion dollars of their money. And the rest of the money comes from debt programs that the federal government and other governments uh, bring forward. And so that pie chart really shows you the balance. And we sort of have this other government debt programs is 50. We really um, are signaling that it requires partnership by all. It is a massive undertaking and um, requires cooperation. And, and that's the only way that we're gonna get through to, to getting these, this housing built in and uh, in our communities. Thank you very much. Just Salima, while you were speaking, we just had one question in the chat sure. about, uh, you'd mentioned there'll be an indigenous architect, but will this have an indigenous provider at this um, building? Yes, yeah, so maybe I'll talk about the design process that we've gone through with Indigenous Architects and I can ask Alessa to answer the question about um, the developer and, and at what her team, how her team will bring that on. But um, the I think the answer is yes to both. Um, and so in the design process on this project, we've worked uh, with two row architects, ensuring Indigenous design principles have come forward in consideration. There's been quite a lot of work around the community, both the urban Indigenous community as well as um, all the, the various nations in uh, the GTA, um, making sure that they understood what we were doing here and bringing forward ideas and thinking, um, particularly to the public realm aspects that are existing on this project. And then Valessa, uh, would you like to answer the question around the developer? Yeah, yeah sure. Thanks, Salima. In terms of uh, the site, so as part of the Housing Now program, Council directed the housing secretary to offer a number of these sites specifically to the nonprofit sector and a number of sites specifically to indigenous organizations. So the site um, is we've we've engaged with the, the indigenous um, community and um, this is a they, they've agreed that this is a great site. So later in this later this year, the housing secretary will issue a formal request for propo proposals um, that. RFP will be made available strictly to the nonprofit sector, sorry, to the Indigenous sector, and we will select um, an Indigenous housing developer and or operator to build out um, the, the project for us and to create um, this new mixed income community that Salima has alluded to. Thanks so much for that. Um, I'm just going to move now to back to you, Deputy Mayor, just to talk a little bit about planning. And some people feel that the planning regimen itself works against being able to build affordable housing. And um, we are trying now to introduce into all of our planning studies, the secondary studies and everything else, uh, uh, an affordable housing lens, which hasn't existed there before. And you were very helpful in the Danforth study to try to achieve some of that. Could you just talk about that for a second? Is that gonna be hard, easy, things we can do to make it easier to add affordable? When someone's already building something, it should be easy to add affordable units, but sometimes we make it hard. Yeah, two things I'd like to talk about that. One of the things is because, you know, when we go into a community meeting, everybody is always asking me, and I'm sure, Councillor, you get the same questions like, why can't you just tell the developer to build afford some affordable housing units? Why can't you? And up to now, uh, we had been saying, well, we've asked 14 times to the province to allow us to have inclusionary zoning. They did allow us to have inclusionary zoning. We did put the, uh, the program together, but now, we are waiting for the provincial government to approve what it's called the protected major transit areas, which is these studies that we have to do around major transit areas, major transit corridors like the Danforth. So these will be areas where there will be required a percentage of affordable housing once they approve those studies that we're doing. So that will be a first step that we will have. And so we, we had a, a full study that we had to do but also what is important to do is to understand that um, 
these projects have to be economically viable. And especially when you're dealing with nonprofits that, you know, uh, they don't have deep pockets. They, they, they are very, very careful with their funds. And so it is really important that we, um, the, that we work with them on build form, on scale, on making sure uh, that, uh, that we give them the opportunity to have as much of affordable housing as possible. And so that's what we did with the Danforth study was um, we created uh, with our angular planes, uh, which we know that eats a little bit into, um, because every floor has to be different. Uh, it, it takes away the, the, the number of units in each floor. So we created a different angular plane on, on Danforth that it, it still well integrates in the community, but allows for more repetitions to happen in the unit. So it makes it easier and cheaper, it creates more units. And the other thing is uh, some lots at the back so that it can go a bit deeper, uh, that, that is allowed to, to happen as well. And you were very keen to say uh, on a motion that you passed uh, to make sure that this Danforth study had that, that lens, and that um, the opportunity to work uh, to create affordable housing was gonna be there. And I think that is important. We need to leave that door open in some of these cases to be flexible enough that when we have some of these really interesting projects that sometimes um, organizations bring through um, and say, you know, we might need uh, a little bit more of a floor here, or like you have so many, you know, uh, old churches that need to be converted and so on that, that that we as a community and with a local counselor can work with them. And so we now have, like I said, we don't have it full. We will have the full implementation, hopefully sometime soon, because, you know, the, we've sent two of these studies that the minister has been sitting on it for 15 months. So hopefully we'll start approving some of these things soon and that we can start having, um, you know, inclusionary zoning implemented on this. But it's also important as we're doing these planning studies mm -hmm. that we ensure that the bill form creates the opportunity to have the affordable housing being created, to have housing being built in the most economical uh, way possible. Thank you so very much uh, for that. And I'm now going to just ask Joy Connolly, who is such an incredible advocate that we have met many times and is in the Circle Land Trust, which was set up specifically to receive all of the housing that to protect it from being sold in case there's another council that might want to try to sell 600 uh, units of housing, three, four and five bedroom houses. Uh, we don't build three, four and five bedrooms. I think Salima would tell you that in housing now, there are no five bedrooms. There are no four bedrooms and there's a small number of three bedrooms. So um, no matter which developer comes forward to build anything, uh, three is where they stop. So losing that kind of stock would have just been incredible. So Joy, you're an East End warrior and you worked very hard for that. And we're very happy to hear a little bit about how um, nonprofits can help manage affordable housing and land trusts. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I feel people already know the story already, pretty much just, just from the references throughout. But I'm well, so what is the land trust, though? Maybe you could tell us that. I don't think everybody knows what that is. Well, let me give you my spiel. And, sure. <laughs> um, and you know, just what listening to what everyone was saying, like, I'm just blown away by how much is going on. I mean, there's so many different initiatives going, so much new housing. Um, I am going to bring uh, a new angle to the discussion, which is about Can I, can I just interrupt? Oh, yes, Joy, sure. I'm so sorry, but I, I, I just want to make a point here that Joy said there's so much going on. And today at the press conference, we'd mention a number that is important to mention. And Joy, you've been doing so much work in affordable housing. You will appreciate those number, this number. We have 109 projects in the city of Toronto going. We have 19,000 units on the go right now in the city of Toronto for affordable housing. Just want to leave that. It's <laughs> Sorry to fun. interrupt. Thank you. Thank it's you. And your deputy mayor has to go at eight. So if you turn off, if you're not there when Joy's finished, thank you so much for coming tonight. And that isn't, those are amazing numbers. Thank you. Go ahead, Joy. 
They are amazing numbers. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal achievement. Um, my focus it really is to talk about uh, bringing to discussion the idea of protecting and investing in the affordable housing we already have. So there are lots of things we could talk about related to that. Uh, but I am going to talk about this initiative that is very dear to my heart, which is Circle Community Land Trust. We're a nonprofit organization, and we were formed by people who saw the value and the potential for the over 700 houses owned by Toronto Community Housing. So as Councillor Fletcher said, these houses, mostly three, four, and five bedroom houses, they're scattered across the city, but especially in the East End. And you know, if you live in the ward, it's an even chance that at least one of these houses is on your street. Um, these houses are a fabulous legacy left to Toronto by city, provincial, and federal decision makers in the 70s and 80s. These houses were bought when houses were so cheap. The, of the ones we know about, an average of $36,000 a piece. And they served the city well as affordable housing. The challenge was that these houses had become a very small part of a very large Toronto community housing. They never really fit in. Some fell into disrepair and some were sold off for, oh, it just breaks your heart, for a pittance in comparison to today's standards. Um, and we know that many of these, over 60%, were flipped for much more than what TCHC got. So that's what can happen when you let go of public assets. Thankfully, there was a better idea in the offing. And I'm so glad that I was on a panel with, uh, I say was because Deputy uh, Mayor has just stepped off and Councillor Fletcher because they were a big part of turning ideas into reality. Councillor Fletcher really supported tenants who wanted to secure the future of their homes and has been a champion for these houses ever since. Uh, Deputy Mayor Bilal, she took on the task of developing a plan for the future of these houses, culminating in 2016 when the city decided to transfer these houses to one or more co-ops, nonprofits, or land trusts. And that's when Circle was formed, bringing together leaders in affordable housing. And so today, after a long multi-step procurement process, because the city was not gonna hand these over to just anyone, Circle is now preparing to assume ownership and management of 561 houses in, the, in Toronto, east of Young, plus a few uh, in the north and far west of the city, with the houses on the west side owned by our friends at Neighborhood Land Trust. So to make this happen, we will be borrowing money, thank you, Van City Community Investment Bank, uh, to pay Toronto Community Housing for the outstanding mortgages on the properties and TCHC's transaction costs, so they're not out of pocket. And thanks to Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, who really went the extra mile with us, we have a mix of grants and loans for a multi-year capital plan to bring every single house to a state of good repair. The city will continue to provide rent supplements geared to the incomes of the tenants now living in the houses. And when a house becomes vacant, it will be filled with a family who needs the deep affordability that a rent supplement offers. And why are we doing all this? It's we have a vision for quality, family-sized, perpetually affordable homes. Roughly 60 of the houses are vacant right now, mainly because they've fallen into disrepair. So even if a house needs $100,000 in repairs, which some do, that investment can bring these three, four or five bedroom houses on stream, ready to serve this generation and the next. You can't build new for that. We have a vision for quality service to tenants. We have a great leadership team and are now hiring a strong team of frontline staff to get cracking on day-to-day -day maintenance and repairs and to ensure that every tenant has someone on staff who knows them, knows their house and can be their go-to person. And we are committed to enabling tenants to engage with the decisions that affect their own homes and to advise the staff on board on circle policies and practice. And when we look into the future, as the houses are brought into good repair, we see the opportunity to free up money to invest in new affordable housing stock. And so the cycle continues. So there's a lot more that I could say, um, but I look forward to the conversation. 
Thank you so much, Joy. And that did start in 2008, and it's only now it's 2022. It's taken such a long time, and yet it's such an important project. And I think it really uh, these are these are really not simple. Putting affordable housing packages together, as Salima knows and Abby knows, and they're they're not simple things. So thank you for your work and your being such a champion and for all the people that will be able to live in affordable housing in the East End and throughout the city with the Circle Land Trust. It's very, very creative, it's brand new, and it can do so much more. I do have a couple of polling questions now before we move to our round table. And it really, somebody did, uh, so this is a poll that how many affordable rental homes do you think the city approved since the start of the housing TO plan in 2020? Less than 5,000, between 5,000 and 10,000, between 10,000 and 15,000, almost 17,000. <clears> 'll we'll give it another minute. There's some heavy voting here. Less than five thousand between five and ten thousand between ten and fifteen thousand or almost seventeen thousand homes. And <clears throat> I don't know if everybody heard the deputy mayor just before she left, she did give the answer. I was so worried that everybody would get it. So it's good we're doing this again because you're now really gonna know the answer when we're done here. And I'm gonna end that poll. And the answer is almost 17,000 homes. And uh, she said 19,000, but that's of the beginning of 2020 was 17,000. It's really quite remarkable that have been approved and the building, it can only get better with the building. And then another question that, because a lot of people say, well, just build it, it's just build it. Really, how much does it cost to build one affordable unit of housing in Toronto? And Joy was talking about spending 100,000 to fix up an existing home, how important that is, because you probably couldn't build anything for 100,000 now, so it's a terrific investment. And so it's between 50 and 100. Nobody's guessed that. That's because you're all really smart here. You know that that's impossible. How about 150 to 200 to get a new affordable unit, let's say in Don Somerville? What's the cost for those to get built into a, a, a project that's already being built between 225 or 300,000? or 450 to 700,000. Those are your choices. And I know nobody's guessed 50 to 100. So got smart people here with us tonight, not only the panel, but lots of smart people on our, on our webinar. And I'm gonna end this shortly. And again, um, I think that many of you might be surprised at the answer, but it is between 450 and 7,000 hundred dollars and it is very hefty price so even in the housing now sites when we're building one third affordable that's actually the cost of of each unit because the prices have gone so high uh, for everything so that's um just an fyi here we're just going to ask about um how units are paid for we're just going to do a little bit of a, a round table here with everybody jumping in and what does it cost and who pays for it? And then we're gonna look at federal and provincial funding and what programs have there been in the past and what we're looking at now. So we did look at that cost of a new unit between 450 and 700,000. So no small change there, but how are they paid for? Salima, how are you showed us a little bit about how they're paid for, but how are those new units really gonna be paid for in um, all of the 21 housing now sites? Sure. Um, so our business model uh, is a partnership between the city and private developers, whether they're nonprofit developers or private developers, or sometimes a mix of the two that come forward and want to, to partner on an opportunity. And what the city says is, here is a zoned site. We're prescribing that list of requirements that I went through on, um, on the last project. 
And in exchange, what we're saying to that, we're offering that opportunity to the developer. And what we're saying in exchange is that you have to provide the affordable housing units. So what does that mean, actually? The developer has to pay to construct. And what they do is they put in their equity, they put in their dollars, and then they go and they get debt financing, construction financing, the same as you would if you were, um, you know, you have a mortgage on your house, they go out and they get, they get debt. Um, and they pay that debt off as they collect rent off of those rental units. And so the economics of that work, because what happens is the city's land offsets that difference between where market rent would be and where that affordable rent would be. So the developer isn't necessarily giving dollars back to pay for the, the land, but they're taking that value and where we are taking that value as a city and investing it back in that building so that we can ensure that those rental units stay affordable. And in housing now, that means a 99 year affordability period. Yes, long-term permanent affordability. And Abby, what are some of the incentives that for not housing now, but when we're building other types of housing that we can, uh, how, how do we get those built? Um, yes, thank you, Councillor. So it's many of the same principles that Salima mentioned work for both housing on our land, but also uh, private sector companies and nonprofits who are trying to build on their own land. And so what the city does there is we will offer um, waivers for our development cost fees, um, which usually developers have to pay us. So we will offset that we'll say you don't have to pay those for affordable housing units. And we will also offer a property tax incentive for the length of time that they will secure that or keep those units affordable. So that's uh, a little bit of the incentives that we offer. And also I think for affordable housing units, we will also be flexible around many of our planning policies around things like you know parking as well. So as a city, we try and find ways to be flexible to make it easier for other people to develop uh, affordable housing on their own land and that encourages people like the United Church or um, you know um, other nonprofits to bring their own land to the table um, and so we can add density because that's other, the other important thing that the city offers is we add density to sites we make them more valuable and that's another way that uh, many developers offset the cost of affordable housing. Thank you. And could you just talk a little bit, uh, Abby or Valesa, about inclusionary zoning and how that's going to work? Um, as Deputy Mayor said, we asked 14 times. And on the 14th, we got an inclusionary zoning, a small amount. They certainly said it wasn't going to be very high. But how will that work, let's say, around the transit stations? Who's going to pay for that? How will that be, how will that be funded? So the city has brought in um, or has proposed a framework for inclusionary zoning. Uh, we still have to wait for those areas around the transit areas to be approved for development, if you like, or the amount of development around those transit areas to be approved by the province before we can actually implement our policy. But basically the city, depending on the location in the city, we will be requiring um, about but up to like 5% uh, growing over the next 10 years. So we start at a lower amount of affordable housing that we require and slowly over time we'll be increasing that until we get to a point where we think we're uh, getting the amount of affordable housing that we need. So that's a process that's gonna develop. It's a policy that's gonna roll out over the next 10 years or so, but starting as soon as we get the approval for those the new density around those transit areas. And I think places like Vancouver already have inclusionary zoning, which means if you're building something, a developer then has to include affordable housing Absolutely. in the project, yeah. right? Yeah, yes, that's correct. Very good. Um, and the cost of a new unit, we've looked at that. It's very, it's very high. Are there dollars from other levels of government that go into building uh, new affordable? Or in particular, how is supportive housing paid for? So when we're looking at the modular units that were open today, and I know you were there. What's the funding formula for that or operational formula to build it and then to operate it? Well, maybe I'll talk about the capital. I'll let Valesa talk about the operating dollars. Um, so 
um, we've been advocating for a long time for the, at the federal level for a really robust capital investment into supportive housing. And the reason for that is because they're offered these units, these homes are offered at very, very low rents for people who have very low incomes. They can't afford mortgages. So the, the same process that Salima described for affordable housing just won't work for supportive housing. So we really need the full cost of delivery. So that's say $450,000 a, a unit to be paid for by government. And so we've been advocating for that. And the federal government brought in a rapid housing initiative where they did exactly that. They brought large amounts of money to the table across Canada. Uh, I think in the first round, it was around a billion. In the second, it was around 1.5. And we're seeing a third round coming soon. And that goes to pay for 100% of the capital cost of the building, which means that we can really turn around and then offer um, those at really, really low rents that, that people can afford. And to do that, the city also brought for some of the sites, we brought our own land to the table. We said, we can put this land in, we'll use the capital cost, and that really keeps the project affordable. But maybe Valesa, I'll hand to you to talk about the operations. Yeah, thank you, Abby. So maybe I'll just start by explaining um, to the audience uh, what we mean by supportive housing. So when we talk about supportive housing, we mean deeply affordable housing that has a range of support services. So a range of social and health and well-being services to help residents really uh, maintain housing stability long term and improve their health and socioeconomic outcomes. So in order, Abby spoke about the federal capital funding, which, which has been essential to develop these homes and make them deeply affordable. Um, to, to make sure that residents are successful, we also need the operating dollars to, to provide these support services. And the operating funding um, is, 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 is typically uh, provided by the provincial government. This is a provincial responsibility. Um, and we, through, over the past, uh, since the pandemic, so over 2021 and, and by the end of 2022, um, the city would have delivered over 33,000 new supportive housing opportunities. Um, and while we are building like the modular site, Councillor Fletcher mentioned today at uh, Cedarville and many other projects on the go, um, while we are building, we need a long-term commitment from the provincial government to ensure that these support dollars and, and the, the funding is there. And not only for one year, but we need that, that commitment for funding continuously because we need to ensure that the residents have that continuity of service. Um, and again, this is, you know, it's, it's, a long, it's a long game. So we need to, to continuously provide those services for people to improve um, and live in dignified homes long term. Thanks so much. I'm just going to move now to the, uh, our last segment, which is federal and provincial funding and um, federal and provincial housing programs. And I'm just gonna call on M Peter Tabins, who's been, I know taking all of this great information on from the city side, but uh, you were very involved in the past in building co-op housing. I know you were very involved in building wood green housing when you were the city councilor for seniors there on Queen Street, 1070 Queen, and um, also in the big, the big national housing strategy previously. So uh, it's really important to hear what a great program all of those were and how well that worked. So I just invite you to speak to us a bit about that, please. Um, Councillor, thanks very much. And uh, before I get right into it, I just want to say how I'm impressed I am with what the city's doing. Uh, I thought that what Deputy Mayor had to say was quite amazing, given the resources and the financial constraints that the city has. Uh, it has been willing to take this on, uh, be very creative and do the best it could to make sure that people weren't living on the streets or, or that people were living in stable and secure housing. And you know very well, Councillor, because you've been at the heart of many of these battles uh, to stop run evictions. Uh, you at the city are building new housing in whatever way you can. And at the same time, we're seeing speculators, speculative landlords driving out tenants so that they can dramatically increase the rents on units. Uh, so as fast as you're building, people are being pushed out of those affordable units that we desperately need. And it's really unfortunate because it was well, unfortunate on a number of levels, but the deputy mayor is quite right. 
we need all three levels of government to work together to solve this problem. And you at the city of Toronto are certainly doing your share. I mean, you are pushing really hard. You're having a concrete impact. I'm very impressed. But you don't have good partners at the other levels of government. Uh, and I'll start with the provincial government because I'm more familiar with it. Very simply, you should not have been put in a position where you were waiting and waiting and waiting for the provincial government to be a partner on inclusionary zoning. Uh, that's something that doesn't cost the provincial government anything and makes a huge difference in people's lives. And you've been willing to do the heavy lifting to make that happen. Uh, the provincial government can change rent control laws so that we aren't having affordable units destroyed before our very eyes. And frankly, the provincial government could be putting more money into rentiered income uh, and portable housing benefits. One of the things that's really striking, people should be aware, is that the number of people in core housing need, that is paying more than 30% of their income, increased between 2011 and 2018. And at the same time, the number of uh, supplements or financial supports decreased, uh, which explains why more and more people are on these long waiting lists for affordable housing, for rent geared to income housing, and are in desperate situations. Uh, I know all of you deal with this, but certainly in my constituency office, regularly we come in, come into our office, finding people waiting at the front door who just cannot stand it any longer because they can't afford where they're living or they're being threatened with eviction because they can't keep up with the rent and there is no alternative for them. So the provincial government is actually scheduled to put less money proportionate to the need over the next decade. You deserve a better partner. People in Ontario deserve a better partner when it comes to housing than we have at this moment. There's no getting around it. Uh, most of the money that the province puts into housing is actually a flow through from the federal government. So the rent geared to income, as I understand it, two thirds federal funds, one third provincial. Uh, you at the city would provide an awful lot more housing if the province was willing to step up and actually put more money in to that rent geared to income program, put more money into portable housing benefits. Uh, I talk to seniors and seniors buildings in this riding who don't have rent geared to income and they are strapped. They are simply strapped. So city, you're doing what you need to do. You're, you're ethically, morally on the right side of the issue. Right now the province isn't. And in the end, it's a question of, will they put the money in and will they stand with people who need housing or with developers who want to maximize their profits? At the federal level, very interesting to look at the national housing strategy, was, which was providing capital funds, support for rent geared to income, and find out until this most recent budget that effectively the feds were spending the same as they were spending under the Harper government. Uh, and as we all know, that was not a shining moment for housing in this country. The feds have put more money in, in this most recent budget, but unfortunately, far less than the national housing groups have asked for, or frankly, than Indigenous communities across Canada have asked for. So I, I think, Councillor, when you say, how does money work at the provincial and federal level? Not very well. You're doing your share. The feds and the province should be doing their share. And that means putting more money in their budgets. And for those who are following it today, the provincial budget did not put more money in. In fact, there's an expectation that there will be fewer housing starts overall in the next few years. Our housing crisis is not projected to get better, it's projected to get worse. And I think the, the work you do is something that housing activists can point to and say, look, governments can take it on. They can act, they can house people. Why don't you at the federal and provincial governments act in the same creative and determined and committed way? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that. Can you describe a little bit about the new federal programs, Abby, and what is in that program? Particularly, there was money there for co-ops. Um, there can always be more, but there is, uh, there is, we can get a little bit of those dollars. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, 
the federal programs, they have a range of programs. Um, the perhaps the most famous one or the one that is most commonly used is the rental construction financing initiative and that is a financing program so it's not uh, grant or equity money that's injected but it's it's cheap financing basically so it's it's a access to a really good program um, which enables people to build and also keep that financing long term which makes it a lot easier for those people who are building so it's a good program it's been well used uh, across the country in fact it's almost oversubscribed it's so it's so popular uh, in addition, they have a co-investment uh, program, which also is really targeted to nonprofits. That also includes financing, but it does include grant contributions as well. Um, they have recently announced, as you mentioned, Councillor, the new money, and Valessa talked about this, the um, financing and contributions for co-op housing. Um, there's not too many details on that just yet, so we're expecting more details within the next few one, uh, weeks as the mandate letters roll out. Um, and then the other uh, program that I would highlight as well is the Housing Accelerator Fund. So that was something new in this budget. Again, we don't have too much information about that, but it's going to be likely a program to incentivize uh, cities like Toronto across the country to increase their housing supply. Um, and so that's going to be a program uh, which we're waiting to see um, what happens. But Valessa, were there other um, federal programs you think we should highlight tonight? I think you, you've captured the main ones, Abby. Those are um, the main programs that are delivering new supply in the city. Um, to your point, the RCFI, Rental Constructive Financing Initiative, has been key to helping um, increase interest and supply in rental housing, but it's oversubscribed. So we know that for that program to continue to be successful and for us to get anywhere close to the level of new uh, rental housing we need, um, there has to be more money into that program. Thanks. Could you just talk a little bit about CMHC and not everybody knows what that is. We assume, is that your cat there? Uh, we just saw your cat, Abby. Thank you. I always like it when people's pets visit us. In my these, dog, actually. Your dog. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. well, welcome to your dog. Yeah. Um, we are in everybody's home. So yes, there's going to be people and animals somewhere in the background. But the CMHC, uh, what is it? How important is it? What do they fund? And what should we expect from that uh, important federal body? What have they done in the past and what should we expect? Uh, so CMHC is Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. So they are the federal government's kind of arm of housing. They report to the Minister of Housing. Um, they're, so they're an important organization and they've had, I would say, historically kind of three main roles. Um, they um, hold a lot of the data and research on housing and housing policy and have done for many years. Uh, they are also act as a lending organization. So they act almost as a bank and they lend and underwrite financing to affordable housing projects. And they are also develop new programs um, and offer grant money and also support uh, development of co the co-op sector and also the nonprofit sector through um, agreements, long-standing agreements, funding agreements that they manage and have managed over many years. So it is through them that the federal government largely kind of funnels its programs. The ones we were talking about are usually funneled through uh, CMHC. Thanks very much. We've had a really interesting question from Catherine and there's so many housing units that we're talking about 17,000 that are gonna be in the pipeline. What's the plan to make sure that the state of good repair, which is making sure they're well repaired, they're not falling apart. And Joy talked about that when she was speaking about the single family homes that some of them need a lot of repair because they were allowed to fall into disrepair. And uh, TCHC housing, when it was downloaded, people need to know it was downloaded by the provincial government without a penny for any repairs. And so the city has had to figure that out because it, we had to take it when they down the province downloaded in uh, 2001. So are there plans for that to make sure that the great housing that's gonna be built 
remains in a good state of repair. I'll ask you, Salima, how that's going to work in your RFPs and everything else, please. Absolutely. Um, so two two answers to that question. In the way that housing now works is the city owns the underlying land. So we're really conscious that it's a public asset and we don't, you know, in the spirit of this conversation, not to dispose, especially, you know, just the very powerful words, Joy, that you brought forward about, um, you know, the importance of that. And so after the 99 year period, we'll say that land is still held by the city. But what it does, it just allows us to control kind of what happens in these projects through a lease agreement. So we're saying, here's an opportunity, you can lease this from us, and here's all the things that come along with it. And one of those is an ob obligation to maintain the units and to make sure that the monies are set aside to maintain the units in a, in a capital uh, approach, uh, a, ca a capital plan approach. The other thing that we do in that lease document is that we have what's called a lease guarantee. And so there is tens of millions of dollars pledged by the developer partners on any one of these single opportunities that is essentially acts as a penalty if they don't um, meet their obligations. And so we sort of ask them to do it. They're demanded to do it through the lease obligation um, or required to do it through the lease obligation. But then we sort of have, we have the stick hanging over their head that says, you know, we have these dollars we can access if you don't fulfill what you have required to do and that works just for for the repair but also for things like ensuring that we maintain that affordability or ensuring that that rent control is in place or that the family size units are there all the different um uh you know requirements that come along with building these complete communities well yes thank you so much Lima, and thank you Catherine for thinking ahead because right you know we just think about building things and we're not thinking about how we're going to keep them in good shape so that people generations and generations can live in them because 99 year affordability there's nobody here tonight on the call or on the panel that's going to be here to see what they look like in 99 years at least I don't think so uh, but obviously no she doesn't think she'll be around for the 99 years but we're guaranteeing the affordability for 99 years and we're guaranteeing the state of good repair for 99 years so it's a very well thought out uh, very very well thought out and i've got one other question and then we're going to wrap but if someone wants to know about veterans housing is there anything in the stream for housing in particular for veterans in this program or is that a federal uh program that is simply a federal program thanks um, I can maybe take this. So, uh, yeah, veterans housing is a federal responsibility. Um, however, um, we're not exclusive of veterans. So uh, many of the programs that the city offers and which are funded through the province or the federal government are open to veterans. Um, for example, unfortunately, we find that many veterans uh, struggle with their mental health or physical health and often find uh, their way into homelessness and so they would benefit from our rapid housing initiative and our modular housing and supportive housing initiative so uh, whilst we don't specifically have a program that targets veterans they are welcome um, into our supportive housing in any of our affordable housing projects and and we would work with partners like there are some nonprofits active in toronto who specifically support veterans we'd be happy to work with uh, any organizations that support the veteran community thank you thank you very much and uh, we're just getting to 8 30 and i think we've had a really great conversation tonight we said we were going to have a conversation about a place to call home and um, I think we're really clear that we're on our way in a new way in the city in doing that, in really taking our land and doing things with that one third, one third, one third, and having the housing secretariat, which as you can see is, and Salima from Create TO, we have a lot of heavy hitters now that are very committed. And you'll notice there's a gender specific here for the heavy hitters. There's a lot of women building affordable housing. I have to say, that's great. It wasn't like that years ago. And so I'm very proud of that actually at our city and at our agencies, how wonderful that is and how talented you all are. And uh, that's not to leave you out of that joy because you are such a talented advocate in dreaming up ways to maintain, protect and build affordable housing. 
it's something that's so near and dear to all of us that are here tonight on this particular webinar. And I just want to thank everybody for spending their time here. Um, Peter, I didn't include you in that uh, gender specific. Uh, we're happy you're here uh, because you do have a lot of history and you did, you did manage the Bain Co-op. And I think what everybody understands is I think co-ops are a really great way of self-managing housing and uh, not perfect, but pretty darn good. And in 1995, there was a great co-op housing movement in Toronto and it was just shut down at that point by the Mike Harris government. So all these little flames are starting back up to try to get more co-op housing because it's a very, um, it's financially good and uh, works well and management is good. So a uh, great way to do it. So I just wanna thank everybody for their time tonight and spending time preparing and spending time with us. This will be made available because all of these contributions were spectacular. And um, just to let you know that you can now go to the Raptors game and cheer on the Raptors. They're a little bit behind, but you can turn off this show and go straight to basketball. Thanks so much, everybody, for being here. Please be well, stay safe. We'll see you in the neighborhood. Thanks so much. Thanks, Paula.